we're just having a few technical difficulties here. If you'll just bear with us, we'll be starting possibly a few minutes past the top of the hour. So just give us a little bit more time, please. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Recording in progress. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, and a very warm welcome back to our COVID-19 press briefing from here in the WHO regional office in Copenhagen, Denmark. A very warm welcome to you all. Very glad you could join us today. Uh, we are also honored, of course, to be joined by my regional director, sat to my left here, Dr. Hans Kluger. Uh, he's going to be joined, and it's a great honor for us to uh, welcome Mr. Philip Corrie, uh, today, uh, UNICEF's Deputy Regional Director for Europe and Central Asia. We're very grateful to have you with us, sir, today. We'd also like to, uh, and we're very excited to hear from um, Ms. Janeka Asatova, um, a teacher in Kazakhstan, who uh, will be making a short statement after the Regional Director this morning. Um, just to remind you who else we've got on the panel before I pass the floor to Dr. Kluger. Uh, we have Dr. Richard Pebody, our team leader on infectious hazard management here in the WHO uh, Health Emergencies Program in Copenhagen. 
We're also joined by Dr. Siddhartha Datta, our Program Manager, Unit Lead for Vaccine Preventable Diseases and Immunization, and uh, a warm welcome also to Dr. Natasha azapadi Muscat, our Director of our uh, Division for Country Health Policies and Systems. So without further ado, I will welcome you once again, and I will pass the floor to the Regional Director. Thank you, Rob, and welcome everyone after the summer. The epidemiological picture in the WHO European region comprising 53 countries is mixed. We now have 64 million confirmed cases and 1.3 million deaths. 33 member states report a greater than 10% increase in 14-day case incidents. This high transmission is deeply worrying, particularly in the light of low vaccination uptake in priority populations in a number of countries. Several countries are starting to observe an increased burden on hospitals and more deaths. Last week, there was an 11% increase in the number of deaths in the region, with one reliable projection expecting 236,000 deaths in Europe by December 1st. Three factors account for this increase. The first is the more transmissible Delta variant, now reported in 50 countries in the region. The second factor is the easing of public health measures, and the third is the seasonal surge in travel, driving a significant growth in case numbers in most countries. We are seeing a particularly steep increase in cases in the Balkans, the Caucasus and the Central Asian Republics. We must be steadfast in maintaining multiple layers of protection, including vaccination and masks. Vaccines are the path towards reopening societies and stabilizing economies. Despite this, we are being challenged by insufficient production, insufficient access and insufficient vaccine acceptance. In roughly eight months, nearly 850 million doses have been administered, with nearly half of the people of the region being fully vaccinated. This in itself is a remarkable achievement. However, in the past six weeks, vaccination uptake has slowed down, influenced by a lack of access to vaccines in some countries and a lack of vaccine acceptance in others. As of today, only 6% of people in lower and lower middle income countries in our region have completed a full vaccination series. Even though nearly three in four health workers in our region have completed a full COVID-19 vaccine series, there are countries that have only managed to vaccinate one in 10 health professionals. There is a clear need to increase production share doses and improve vaccine access so that they may offer a full series of vaccination to populations. Everyone everywhere should have the right to receive the full course. Vaccination is a right, but it's also a responsibility. The stagnation in vaccine uptake in our region is of serious concern. Now that public health and social measures are being relaxed in many countries, the public's vaccination acceptance is crucial. If we are to avoid greater transmission, more severe disease, increases in deaths, and a big risk that new variants of concern will emerge. Vaccine skepticism and science denial is holding us back from stabilizing this crisis. It serves no purpose and is good for no one. Public participation is vital for successful COVID-19 vaccination. Understanding people's perceptions, including their concerns regarding vaccine safety, helps countries to inform communities and healthcare providers where and when needed. It is imperative that health authorities look very closely into what determines vaccination uptake by population groups and then establish tailored interventions at community level to boost vaccine uptake. 
together with its member states. WHO Europe has developed pragmatic tools and guidance to identify and resolve bottlenecks in immunization programs, allowing countries to build on other countries' good practices. These tools are at every government's disposal. Increasing vaccine production, sharing these doses equitably, and driving vaccine acceptance and demand are the three fundamental elements needed to deliver on the promise that vaccination can move the European region beyond the pandemic. My final points concern children. Their schools must be open. School closures stall academic performance, increase the likelihood of children dropping out of education and affects children's mental health. Our children have suffered greatly over the past 20 months especially those who were already vulnerable and or could not benefit from digital ways of teaching. Unlike a year ago, we are now in a position to keep them safe. As millions of children return to school, WHO Europe and UNICEF call for all necessary measures to be taken such that schools are open and remain open. These include to implement vaccination strategy targeted at teachers and school personnel and to children above 12 as well, especially those with underlying conditions. Improve the school environment through clean sanitation and hand hygiene, ventilation, smaller class sizes where possible, physical distancing, masks depending on the local risk assessment, and regular testing of children and staff. And above all, protect children's mental and social well-being. Today, we are joined by Janerke Asetova, a language teacher in Kazakhstan, who understands these challenges firsthand. As we enter another school year, I am eager to hear how she intends to manage COVID-19 measures in her school and classroom. In closing, I wish to thank Janerke and all the teachers around the world who have had to navigate challenging times, but who have continued to serve their communities and our future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regional Director. So on that note, I'm going to go straight across to Kazakhstan now, to Janerke joining us on the uh, Zoom link that we've established with her uh, to share some of her opinions, uh, insight, experience um, with us today. So, Janeka, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. We're very grateful. Uh, Janeka, we can't actually hear you, Janeka. Sorry, you may be on mute. No, I'm afraid we still don't have audio at the moment. No, Janeka, we unfortunately we don't have audio. We'll come back to you. Uh, shortly, I'll come back to you. Instead, I will move on, if you'll allow me, Janeka. We'll come back to you in just a few minutes. Um, if we if we can uh, move on, I'm going to go over to UNICEF's Deputy Regional Director, Mr. Philippe Corrie, uh, to make a short statement. As uh, the Regional Director noted in his opening statement, um, WHO Europe and the UNICEF Europe and Central Asia Office today are jointly calling for schools in our region to remain open and be made safer from COVID-19. So I'm going to go over to Mr. Philippe Corrie. Mr. Corrie, I hope that you can join us online. Yes, uh, good morning. Can you hear me? We can, please. Perfect. So uh, first, thank you to, uh, to Hans and all the colleagues uh, of WHO in teaming up 
for this very important uh, call to reopen uh, schools. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to hear also Zanerke because she represents quite a number of teachers who are on the front line. And I'd like to thank also, I mean, I see so many uh, colleagues from the media and, and thank you to, to uh, WHO to allow us to, to address them. We need your help. It's very serious what's happening. The closing of school uh, for 28 weeks as an average in Europe, Central Asia, and we have seen the Western Balkan, and, and up to and more than one year in some countries like uh, Bosnia, North Macedonia, Turkey, is extremely concerning. It's basically a massive destruction, destruction of our social cohesion, uh, of our societies on the long run, because it is uh, affecting the most vulnerable children, you know, the children with disabilities, living in rural areas, girls, migrant and refugee children, children from minorities like Roma. So basically 25 million children, uh, particularly the most vulnerable children of our societies have been uh, absent from any form of distance learning over the last few uh, months. So it's really something that is questioning uh, ourselves. I mean, it's on the top of uh, some uh, close to 5 million children out of school already in this region. And we already know that more than 19 million children in this region were not even when they were schooled, uh, achieving you know, the level of proficiency in math and reading uh, prior to the pandemic. So it's a massive destruction in the making of our social cohesion and of our efforts in uh, sustainable development, all the achievements we have been uh, having so far. So a lot is at stake and we need your help to convince government communities to reopen classrooms to our children adolescents uh, across our region. And we have worked with uh, colleagues from uh, WHO, we are, as you know, UNICEF is on the ground, you know, providing support to governments with guidelines, tips, working with teachers, uh, practically in terms of, and the toolkit has been developed in this, uh, in this regard to make sure that we are at, as practical as possible to facilitate proper conditions, healthy conditions for this learning. But this distraction of learning uh, across the region and face-to-face -face learning is really, really uh, uh, a challenge for our society. So it, it's really important the face-to-face -face, um, approach to schooling uh, come back uh, to our region. Uh, and, and this exclusion uh, of uh, any form of learning of the most vulnerable is really something that will be ultimately, you know, quite a, uh, a burden for our long-term uh, cohesion and investment in um, in social cohesion and uh, social development. So therefore, that reopening is really something we need to convey. And it's important not only to support governments, communities on how to technically and practically uh, ensure a healthy uh, learning. I mean, we have seen some good examples uh, quoted by Hans, uh, ventilation, I mean, the distancing um, uh, in the classroom uh, and simple, you know, of course, the washing of hands and of course the mask when needed uh, and it's uh, special attention to, to children with uh, underlying conditions. So this is all possible. We need to re-empower to our parents so that they could support their children and for instance, UNICEF has developed a parenting app uh, that would uh, give you know, good tips for, for parents in these conditions and uh, based on the age of a child. So we need to be very practical. We need to reassure, we need to work with teachers. Uh, we need to address vaccine hesitancy by explaining, not stigmatizing, explaining why vaccination is important. Uh, and teachers are very important in this regard. Uh, and we need them because they could also be the advocates you know, for vaccination. Uh, and so they need to be understanding how it works, why it is so important. Uh, and this work with teacher has been also very uh, important for UNICEF in terms of uh, their capacity to be online. You know, many of our teachers were not necessarily trained to be teaching and having curriculum online. So it was very important uh, to work uh, uh, on this new approach. And, and we have uh, now a, a new program uh, called Learn In that is dedicated to teachers to be able to teach and follow uh, the learning, the quality of the learning, the inclusiveness of the learning online as well, and do some kind of blend approach in terms of face-to-face -face and uh, online teaching. So they are very much uh, the frontliner as well uh, for us, uh, and they are key uh, you know, partners that we wish to, uh, to continue to support uh, practically on the ground. So I'll stop there because um, it's so important to hear now uh, Zanerke, I hope uh, Zanerke can, um, can be online, but really uh, the media support, convincing communities, government, 
uh, to reopen their schools, municipalities, mayors, uh, decision makers, uh, caregivers, uh, to ensure that uh, this uh, school will be reopened in, in best possible conditions. Uh, and this you know, joint effort is only the way to move forward. So thank you so much. Over. Deputy Regional Director UNICEF, Mr. Corey, thank you very much for those words. I'm going to I, I'm going to take those words and 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 go to one of our immediately over to one of our panel members to add a few comments shortly. Janeka is still trying to make contact with us, so we will come back to her in a few more minutes. We'll just give it a little bit more time. So I'm going to go over to the panel because quite a few of the questions have related the, to the measures um, that well, what member states can adopt to minimize transmission in the virus of schools. Mr. Corey's just spoken to that. I'm gonna go across to one of our panel members, Dr. Azapardi Muscat, who's the D WHO Europe Director for Country Health Policies and Systems, and ask Dr. Muscat if she could add uh, a point or points regarding this question, because it's coming, Natasha, from a number of different uh, journalists over the uh, last 24 hours. Basically, what are some of the measures WHO member states can adopt to minimize transmission of the virus in schools? Maybe you could add a few points to what's been said. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob, and good morning. And perhaps just to start again, it bears repeating that schools are not isolated from the rest of the community. So now more than ever at this point, it's critical for all of us to do whatever we can to keep levels of community transmission down. And I would also just like to uh, um, recall that a year ago to date, we had the first meeting discussing schooling, and it was a very different predicament and situation for all of us. Now, so many things have changed because we have vaccines available. And in many countries, teachers have been offered the opportunity to get vaccinated. Otherwise, we continue to call for teachers to be amongst the priority groups for children who are given the opportunity to be vaccinated also to take up this opportunity for parents to allow their children over the age of 12, if they are invited to be vaccinated, to do so, particularly those children who may be at higher risk. Of course, um, Hans and our colleague also from UNICEF have mentioned the importance of ventilation in countries where outdoor activities are possible to continue to be able to do this so that we preserve extracurricular activities as much as, as possible too. Um, mask usage, this is often one of the questions that is raised. And as WHO, we have um, detailed guidance, but just also, if I may remind people that we are facing a Delta surge. Delta is highly infectious. And therefore, it's important not to throw caution to the wind and to uh, be very aware, particularly in areas, localities and countries where there is ongoing transmission, to be able to use masks in the school setting where distancing may not be possible. And finally, also when it comes to testing and testing strategies, we've seen so much evolution over the past year in terms of the tests that are available, rapid tests, tests that perhaps are less invasive and more acceptable to be carried out on children. And over here, the importance also of judiciously using testing to avoid mass and blanket quarantines as far as possible, so as to be able to move towards more targeted quarantine of children who are truly exposed, so as not to disrupt education. We anticipate that there will be cases in schools because schools are places where children gather and come together. And therefore the importance of not disrupting education through blanket quarantines, but um, using the quarantine appropriately and complementing this with testing. And finally, the importance of engaging the teaching community as well as children and adolescents in doing whatever they can do to keep transmission down. When we convened our high level group on schooling that has worked really hard and I'd like to acknowledge their work over the past months to be able to come up with these recommendations, we also involved the voice of school children. 
and it's incredible how much the children themselves can do if given the right information and equipped and empowered to take decisions to protect themselves. Back to you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natasha. Um, so thanks very much. I'm going to come back because there's a few questions regarding schooling. But before I do, I'm going to uh, go back uh, again over to Kazakhstan shortly. But um, before I do that, there's a question we've received, uh, and I would encourage you all to raise your hands, please, in the system, or write your questions in the chat function, the journalists joining us today. We have a question from AFP, from Camille bass -Wallet. Um, I think this is to you, Regional Director. You said it will be some time before we can put the pandemic behind us, but what does it take to reach the end of the pandemic tunnel? Why is it taking us so long? Regional Director. Thank you, Camille, and good to, to have you back. So there are a number of impediments which are in the way to achieve faster than 80% benchmark. So first, too many people remain hesitant to embrace either the vaccine or the public health measures. The second one is that too many countries still struggle to have access to the vaccine itself in our pan-European region of 50 countries. The third one is that too often countries believe prematurely that the pandemic is over while it is just a wave passing and then they have to return back. And next one is that in no regard, there is not enough effort or focus on the development of therapeutics in addition to the vaccine. But we also believe that we can overcome those with the following three directions. The first one, top priority, is to roll out the vaccination equally. So uptake, production, and sharing of the vaccines, and to do this also together with the private sector, and it doesn't matter whether it's bilaterally or multilaterally. What's important, that countries with a surplus are not waiting too close to the expiry date, because if then they are doing a donation to a country, it's very tough for everyone, so not to hoard on the vaccines. And of course, as I was telling, the top priority is to reduce vaccine scepticism while engaging, empowering the communities, and if need be, to consider mandatory measures for the most exposed population groups and professions. This is the first one. The second strategy is to implement what I call nuanced approaches within our pan-European context. And this includes, for example, expanding the vaccination programs to children and additional jabs. I think I was in the United States in August discussing with the authorities the transatlantic cooperation and discussing also Dr. Anthony Fauci. And we had together the same, uh, let's say, conviction that a third dose of vaccine is not a luxury booster taken away from someone who is still waiting for a first jab, but it's basically a way to keep the people safe, the most vulnerable. But at the same time, we need to share, so we need to do it all. And finally, very important, the third direction to get out of it is to maintain a proportionate pressure against the virus. During periods of tranquility, by not surrendering on masks, ventilation, mobility control, and intensified testing policies. And if I speak at a global level, pressing the virus starts with sharing all our data. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regional Director. I'm now going to try and go over to Kazakhstan to Ms. Janeka Asatova, a teacher in Kazakhstan. Janeka, let's try again to see if we can, we can hear you this time. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Great, we can. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Janeke. I'm a Kazakh teacher at Astana Garden School, speaking to you today from the capital of Kazakhstan. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. Last year, when the world first faced COVID-19, I was at the beginning of my teaching career. It was a big challenge for all of us to ensure the continuity of learning in condition of lockdown. It was also challenging for students to adapt to the new reality, as not all of them had access to a computer device or the internet. This created an additional divide. 
you could call it a digital divide. Everyone suffered, teachers and students alike. It's amazing how quickly we all learned to adapt because we had no choice. If we didn't, our students would suffer and education is the most important thing to help children realize their dreams. However, there came a new problem. Lots of students start to have mental health problems caused by lack of social contacts. Young people need to learn in a group environment so they can learn from others. I observed that high school students tend to be more stressed and frustrated, while junior students were happy to spend hours in front of computer playing the games we include in our lessons. Online learning has affected not only the well-being of the community, but also the quality of education. Students couldn't get an individual attention when needed. It was difficult for teachers to give an extended feedback. Kazakhstan offered the vaccine to teachers earlier this year, and I jumped at the opportunity because I know this would be the only way I could return to in-person teaching while keeping myself and others safe. Now, in just two days time, schools in Kazakhstan are reopening after the summer holidays, and I'm so excited. I can't wait to teach my students directly, help them with their problems, and be a pillar in the community. Our schools are so important because this is where next generation of scientists, politicians, and writers are created. This is where dreams are made. We must support our schools to remain open, whatever happens. And the most Recording effective way stopped. to do this is to get vaccinated when you can. All of us can do our bit to make sure next generation doesn't suffer the consequences of our actions right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anerka, for this testimony and particularly for your professional commitment and your passion as you also represent so many teachers this morning. We really appreciate it a lot and very good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aneka. Thank you, Regional Director. We're going to go straight to the journalists now online, and I'm going to start with Esmir Milevic from N1 Bosnia. Esmir, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, the question is for um, Regional Director and uh, question is, you just recently visited Bosnia and Herzegovina, but you also uh, spoke today about the situation in Balkans and that the uh, situation in, ba in Balkans worries you. But what we saw over the last uh, week or so is that the key politicians with whom you met uh, here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, such as a speaker and deputy speaker of the parliament, but also member of the presidency, um, attended to the large events on which we saw uh, absolute and total disregard of um, all measures, um, including uh, not wearing a mask and um, disobeying uh, social distance and uh, everything. And those events were from few hundred to few thousand people um, at the place. And um, also we had a situation where the uh, spouse of the uh, deputy speaker of the parliament, Mr. Izetbegovic, is also a medical professional and she attended uh, uh, one of those um, events. So uh, what kind of message that sends to people in Bosnia and Herzegovina and what we should do to change this um, situation to lower the numbers uh, in upcoming weeks? Thank you. Okay, I'll, thanks very much, Esme. I'll hand that to the regional director first and then I'm gonna go over to Dr. Richard Hebedy. Thank you, Esme. And let me speak from a uh, regional perspective that in countries where the incidence of COVID-19 is on the rise, and particularly they're facing new waves, all the basic measures apply, right? Keeping the distance, wearing the masks, hand hygiene, strengthening the health system, and definitely avoid it large mass gatherings, unless, of course, really very strict hygiene conditions can be put in place. Let me give you one example. Together with our uh, governing body board, we have decided to hold our annual regional committee. This is our annual 
governing board of 53 minutes of health. The 13th of September, we have decided to hold it virtually, exactly because of the epidemiological situation. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Pebedi, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, no, thank, thank you very much. I, I, I mean, I think the points are all very well made. And uh, of course, as, as we heard, uh, that one of the key issues dr driving the increases in transmission that we're seeing across the region has, has been the spread of the, the Delta variants that has happened over the summer months. We know this variant is more transmissible than the previous circulating viruses and is also associated with increased risks of um, severe disease, particularly hospitalization compared to the to the previous circulating viruses. So we do need to get back to the basics, as, as we heard, the proper implementation of the public health measures um, to reduce uh, transmission in the community when we start to see um, it, it, it increases in transmission. And of course, um, the increases in vaccine uptake in the priority groups to really provide protection from them from severe disease, from um, hospitalization and, and from um, other, other severe consequences. And, and we know that the vaccine still provides excellent protection against the Delta variants, against, against severe disease around. Thank you, Dr. Pevardy. Uh, next, I'm gonna, thank you very much for the question, Esmir. Next, I'm gonna go over to Peter Kenny from the Anadolu uh, News Agency. Peter, please, the floor is yours. Peter, we got no sound at the moment. Rob, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Jamie. Is that that sounds this like is Jamie? It's not. Uh, it's not Peter Kenny, but I, I'll take the opportunity to ask a question. <laughs> Jumping the queue, brilliant, Jamie. Thank you very much, uh, um, <laughs> Doctor Doctor Kluger. Thank you very much for your for your presentation. I want to just make sure you mentioned your conversation with Doctor Fauci. Um, these WHO Europe. Hey, uh, this is Peter Kenny here. Well, now you're cutting on me, Peter. Peter, Peter if you could just wait a moment, we'll just hear okay. Jamie's question, then I'll come back to you, Peter. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Dr. Kluger, you mentioned Dr. Fauci. Um, is it your belief then that boosters are needed for um, uh, for for, uh, for uh, within 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 Europe? I mean, because that's been an issue. Um, so, what is your exact stand on that question of, of boosters? And um, it sounds to me like you know the WHO um, headquarters has been hesitant or has been talking more about the importance of vaccinating healthcare workers and the vulnerable and particularly impoverished countries. That seems to go somewhat against what you seem to be saying about a, a targeted implementing implementation strategy on adolescents. Who I think, if I can sort of maybe paraphrase what WHO headquarters has said, is you know that children are not as quite a high priority. So could you just um, address your policy on boosters and whether or not there's a, a slight uh, nuance in the, your position against, um, against WH headquarters in terms of vaccination of children? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jamie. So to implement nuanced approaches within our pan-European context is one of the three strategies which I see to get out of this uh, mayhem, let's say towards a sustainable control of transmission. So we are fully aligned on the principle of equity. Everyone has really the right to get a full series of vaccines. But to start from the children, we need to keep the schools open. So if you look in the pan-European context, if the vaccines are available, then yes, the adolescents definitely have to be vaccinated because otherwise, uh, especially in the context of the Delta variant, we will face uh, many more challenges. So absolutely, on the booster, we have to be a little bit careful because there is not yet enough evidence. And I think that's where Dr. Fauci and me were discussing that it goes towards, in fact, maybe the word uh, booster is not uh, the correct word, Jamie. We should say an additional dose that this ultimately will be seen if, if the evidence evolves in that direction as part and parcel of a complete basic regimen so that it's not taking away a vaccine from someone who is waiting but basically 
an important instrument to keep particularly the vulnerable people safe. So that's where uh, we stand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regional Director. Thanks for the question, Jamie. So I'll go back over to Peter Kenny. Uh, Peter, can we now? Um, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Jamie, for asking my question. Um, uh, I would just like to know, uh, Dr. Kluger, if you think that um, these additional jabs or vaccinations, uh, whether the, the debate about this is going to confuse people about the whole system of vaccination, because people are saying in some countries it's time for a booster, in some countries are offering boosters. Could you explain something on that? Thank you. Yes, Peter. This comes back not only to this question, oh, we have been, we meaning countries, agencies struggling from the very beginning. We have to be careful of making policy decisions within an uncertain context or when, like in this case, the evidence is not available yet. So what's very important to keep the trust in science is to have transparent communication towards the people. Remember with the vaccines that there are uh, about the side effects and other um, instances, well, so we learned the lesson. So we have to explain to the people that the evidence is not watertight, that the importance is do it all. I think this is the key, Peter, do it all, right? So there are more and more studies telling that a third dose, if uh, previously it was two doses, keeps vulnerable people safe, like a number of countries more and more are doing in our region. But at the same time, countries need as soon as possible to share their excess doses. And we know there are I have appointed a special advisor on the COVID-19 vaccination rollout already months ago. We have detailed lists of EU, Israel, UK, what's the excess, which vaccines, expiry date, and what are the needs in the other countries, particularly in the east of our region. And that's what we are doing, I'm doing on a daily basis. I call it target health diplomacy, speaking to presidents and prime ministers to share vaccines, and not only with the European region, but also with the African region and all the regions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I'll go to Nikolai Skuzgard from Reuters. Nikolai. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Thanks, Nikolai. All right, thanks. Uh, and just uh, a follow-up question to, to, the, to the third jab. Um, are you guys in, in discussions with any uh, EU or European uh, states about the use of boosters? Is, is, uh, are you... Are you Sort of uh, sp sp speaking to countries on a more detailed level about uh, this, the maybe contextual use of, of, of sorry, third jabs. Uh, and then uh, 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 another question um, on the, and I don't know if this is something you'd like to speak to, Kluge, but uh, on, on the origins of the virus, um, do, do you guys uh, consider a, a lab incident in China a scenario that needs to be looked further into, also on the backdrop of, of, of this US report uh, on the origins that recently came out? Um, so, so yeah, what's your stance on, on looking further into the origins of the virus? Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Nikolai. I'll first go over to Dr. Siddhartha Datta, who's our regional advisor for vaccine preventable disease and immunization on your first question. And then I'll turn the one on origins of virus to uh, the regional director. So first, Siddhartha, please. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I hope you hear me well. So thank you, Nikolai, for that question. In terms of uh, our engagement with uh, member states, yes, indeed. I mean, we use different mechanisms to, number one, understand the decision-making process that member states are making in their country for use of these additional doses. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of things here. A decision-making process in a country involves the uh, participation of the National Immunization Technical Advisory Group of experts who look into the local disease epidemiology, the vaccine doses availability, the vaccine uptake at this point of time of the different population groups, and what are the evolving nature of the evidence as, uh, you know, uh, as have been evolving, not only for this vaccine per se, but around the globe, what are the evidences being generated for this additional dose and waning of immunity and et cetera. 
as you have heard the regional director say that any decision the country is making should be based on robust data, robust science, and robust evidence. And that is what we are also engaged with different member states. In terms of the European Union member states, we are also engaged with European CDC for their uh, discussion around the National Immunization Technical Advisory Groups, where these decision makings are being discussed in detail. But WHO brings about the available evidence wherein the member states can look into the local context and see what is the evolving nature of science around this topic. Thank you so much. Pass it back to you, Rob. Thank you. And with the second question, we'll go over to the regional director. Yes, uh, Nikolai. So this is directly, this effort is directly led by uh, WHO headquarters and the director general who recently has established a special expert group to look into the origins of this virus, but also future novel pathogens. And at this stage, we, there is not enough uh, evidence and facts. So I think we have to remember that to study the origin of a zoonotic agents takes time. This has been the case of MERS, has been the case of SARS, can easily take one year and a half up to two years. It is not, it's not easy. So in that sense, I would say that it's very important to give this study its time and not to jeopardize it at this stage. And our exit point is always a good collaboration with the different partners involved, because that's ultimately why the United Nations were established. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regional Director. So next, I'm going to go across to Jan Dirk Herbermann, um, who is a German-based, Gene uh, Geneva-based, excuse me, German journalist uh, with a number of different uh, outlets. So Jan, I'm going to go over to you next. Are you with yes. us? Good Thank morning. You. Can, go can ahead. you hear me? We can. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, yes, uh, uh, Dr. Kluger, I have a question on vaccine donations. Um, do you know how many doses have been donated by countries of the region uh, to other countries um, and to COVAX? And uh, also, I'd like to ask you on the vaccine skeptics. Uh, you, you just said that uh, vaccination is a right and also a responsibility. So what can be done to convince uh, vaccine skeptics or to pressurize them into getting vaccinated? Thanks very much, Jan. I'll go to the regional director and then back to Siddhartha. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Yes, we have a detailed inventory. Basically, the WHO Regional Office for Europe serves at what I call a matchmaking forum. So from both countries with surplus and in need, we have a good uh, overview, and that's why I pointed a special uh, envoy on that one. Of course, it may be that sometimes it takes a bit of time that if a country bilaterally decides to give donations, but we do have also, as you may know, 31 country offices, and that's what we uh, used to try to equally have equity in vaccination rollout. This is comp it's what I call COVAX Plus, so it's complementary to the COVAX, but we also know that uh, the, the COVAX ultimately will go up to 20%, and the target set by our expert group is 80%. That's on the, the first part. The second part, Dr. Siddhartha will go a little bit more in detail, but our principle has been not to blame the people, but to try to understand their perceptions. I think the key issue here, from my perspective, is that still too many policies in countries are made based on perceptions, assumptions, and not on data. And that's why, among others, we established a special unit on behavioral and cultural insights. But with this for the details, Rob, maybe we can go to Siddhartha. Of course, of course. Uh, we go over to uh, Siddhartha Data. Thank you, Siddhartha. Thank you, Rob. And, and just uh, continuing from the point where the regional director you left, the, we, we strongly feel that any decision that is being made by the country should be based on local data on vaccine uptake. And countries, as you have heard uh, the regional director mention in, in his opening remark, that the understanding the reasons behind the vaccination uptake will allow devising a locally tailored intervention. So that's number one. The second part is people may have questions 
And I think this should not be seen as people being hesitant to receive a vaccine. This understanding of their questions or uh, in any question that they may have, any concern that may have, both on vaccines and vaccination, should be seen as sort of a health-seeking behavior of the population. This should be seen as their process of going towards an informed decision, an informed choice. And I think it's extremely important that the governments make effort to listen to, address them, and be prepared so, or equipped themselves to answer those questions. And extremely, this is an extremely important element. Within the WHO Regional Office, as you have heard the regional director say, we have the Behavioral Cultural Insights Unit, one of its kind in the WHO, uh, in the entire WHO, which looks into people's perception, why people would not be taking a vaccine, what are the different factors which are influencing their decision-making process. That's where WHO comes along, very context-specific again, to work with countries to find out and devise what interventions would work. And just one quick you know, data uh, that you requested, Jan, about the vaccine donation, just to give you a very quick summary that we have received from COVAX that they, they, you know, in, the, in the WHO European region, we have received around 7 million uh, doses being donated from Sweden, from France, the United States of America to our uh, WHO European uh, in a region, countries in our WHO European region. But overall, several countries have donated around 95 million doses to the COVAX for for distribution, uh, but this is over and beyond the bilateral uh, numbers that are uh, bilateral doses that are being shared by uh, by our European Union member states to to the to the other countries. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question, um, and also thanks to the regional director and Siddhartha for those responses. I'm next going to go over to Ancho Lamela from EFE in Spain. Hello, uh, can you hear me? We can. Please go yes. ahead. Great. Uh, I got a question for Dr. Kluge. Uh, in your statement, you said that the high transmission is deeply uh, worrying, and you mentioned the easing of public health measures as one of the factors. Uh, Denmark has had the epidemic under control for weeks or months. Uh, face, masks, face masks are not mandatory anymore. And last week, the Danish government said that they will remove all the restrictions in a couple of weeks. As the WHO Regional Office for Europe is based in Copenhagen, do you have any thoughts about that? Thank you. Thank you. So a number of points here. The first one is that Denmark is a champion in vaccination uptake. There is a maximum degree by the population in uh, trust in the vaccine, and which translated really in a very high vaccination uptake, number one. Number two, the health system is capable to implement really a large-scale testing strategy and it includes genomic sequencing. So, as the minister, Manus Hoenicke, was telling a couple of days ago, it does not mean that the country at one point may not have to go back and implement some more restrictive measures, but the target is that this would be done locally. So if you detect locally some outbreak, that then in that local environment, some more restrictive measures are being implemented without having to go to large scale. Having said that, we have to, like in any other country, this has to be followed uh, very, very closely. Thanks very much. Now I'm going to go to two other panel members with this question. The first I'm going to go to is Richard Pevody. See if there's any points you'd like to make. And then to Siddhartha, I'll ask you both to be brief, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rob. Um, I mean, not, not much to add except to flag that um, certainly Denmark has a very strong um, laboratory based surveillance system in place. Um, which in, at very high rates of uh, testing for individuals with um, acute respiratory illness and also contacts as well. Um, and consequently, uh, that they're able to um, utilize that system to maintain levels of, of transmission at low levels at the moment, um, both in country and, and, and at the borders as well. Uh, but clearly uh, that needs to be flexible. Um, and if they do see increased levels of transmission, then as uh, the regional director mentions, um, that would then need obviously tightening of public health measures accordingly. 
Over now. Thank you, Richard. Siddhartha? Thank you. Just to uh, you know, outline the vaccination part of COVID-19 uh, in, in Denmark as the regional director has you know, outrightly mentioned, there's a very high vaccination uptake across the population groups in Denmark. If we quickly look into the numbers, people more than 60 years of age, according to the data available with WHO, 98% have completed their cities, meaning either they, they have completed the two doses. And adults which are under than 60 years of age, they have 76% of them have uh, received a uh, two-dose uh, vaccination series, so which is indeed a great reflection, not only about people's perception and trust on the government, but we also would like to acknowledge the effort made by the Ministry of Health and the government to ensure that they do get access to the information. The vaccination is being made convenient and also ensuring that the, uh, the, the, the community level based understanding of reasons what were be holding some of the people back were then put into place so that there is increased coverage or uptake in, in the population. So I think, again, going back to what regional directors say, do it all, even if they do it all within the vaccination, there's no cherry picking, but we have to make entire system run behind to make a vaccination uptake successful. Great lessons to learn from Denmark indeed. Thank you. Thanks for those responses. Thanks for the question, Axel. Uh, I understand, Jamie, you had a second question that we didn't get to. Could it, please go ahead. Jamie Keaton. Jamie, you're still with us? No. Okay. Well, in that case, I'm going to ask the uh, Deputy Regional Director for UNICEF, Philippe, uh, if you have any comments you'd like to make before I hand the floor back to Hans to make some concluding remarks. No, thank you very much indeed. I mean, it was uh, very good to have this uh, exchange with media and concerns. But I just put it in the in the chat box. You know, we I understand that people are concerned about the third uh, jab or not, uh, and where and how. But thousands of children are missing their regular vaccination these days. Polio is back. Measles is uh, growing, and nobody is that much mentioning that you know this entire cohort of children have been missed in Europe and Central Asia. So this is extremely uh, you know, worrisome uh, because of the uh, disruption of health services. So if media could also bring the attention that you know, vaccination is really uh, to be continued because this hesitancy, uh, uh, and therefore, as colleagues have mentioned, we should not stigmatize people who are hesitating. We should explain and try to bring trust back because it could jeopardize, and we see already some effects, all the efforts and investment made in ensuring vaccination against preventable disease uh, that we are used to do uh, across Europe and Central Asia. So that if media could also stress that importance uh, of getting you know, our, our children immunized uh, as per their regular uh, vaccination program that have been made available uh, over the years and saving two to three million children uh, per year uh, in the world. Uh, this is what is at stake as well. Uh, uh, not only the third jab or not. So it's very important that we emphasize that aspect as well so that health system be thinking uh, in terms of their capacity of continuing and, and you know, reassuring as well caregivers, parents, and, and, and community leaders uh, around uh, you know, vaccination. So that's really what it is all about. And uh, as Hans said, it's about you know, uh, understanding people, having studying as well, uh, behavioral insights. And in UNICEF, we have a, also a dedicated um, section on that to understand what is uh, you know, the, the, the narrative that is blocking people to, uh, to trust uh, vaccination as they used to uh, for their children uh, before. So that's really uh, for us also a dimension that we need to uh, along uh, the school reopening to, to emphasize. And thank you again to, um, to your interest uh, as media and uh, to um, our colleagues in WHO. Over. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you to you and the panel members for joining us today. A particular thank you to Janeka and to really, as the regional director said, all teachers uh, across our region, around the world for their dedication and their contribution to our society, to our communities. They deserve our respect and applause. So a warm thank you to Janeka and all of them. It only remains for me to close the uh, press briefing today. Uh, this press statement by the regional that the regional director made will be available 
uh, on is available online. Um, it only remains for me to say, uh, take care out there and uh, we'll welcome you back in the not so distant future for another press brief on COVID-19. Thank you very much for, your, for joining us today.